Thank you, Yair. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and um, um, I'm actually my first time at Yale, so uh, very interesting on many accounts. Um, I'm, as you might have noticed from the title, uh, somehow my background looks uh, a bit different in the sense that I'm going to try to talk to you about um, trying to explain to you why uh, what people like uh, Scott Sheffield, myself, uh, uh, or the Trump, a uh, number of people um, in sort of uh, have been doing on random two-dimensional systems is very much related with the R4 spheres uh, legacy type uh, of mathematics and uh, why uh, maybe uh, this your community should uh, you know, be interested in that, trying to convince you uh, about uh, these things. Of course, probably several of you, or may, most of you have heard you know, talks about this uh, general story before uh, by uh, other people. But how, nevertheless, when I was preparing the, uh, this lecture, I figured that probably the most useful was still uh, you know, not to dive into the very recent uh, the most recent uh, things, but rather to try to give you a general picture of uh, presentation of one aspect of, uh, of, uh, of this that can be, you know, be presented in a self-contained way. And uh, because you're mathematicians, um, you will not be interested or particularly uh, sort of um, uh, motivated by maybe the physical background, why physicists have been interested in that. And uh, why, uh, you know, in some sense, we are more interested in concrete things about conformal transformations rather than, uh, you know, abstract physical field theories. Um, but uh, I'm, maybe I can just say that uh, the story I'm going to tell uh, has, I mean, there are motivations for this coming from physics, both uh, from sort of fairly concrete physics, like, you know, you take some model and then you see these random structures emerging uh, in sort of almost real real life uh, or in a very sort of a meta theoretical approach to physics and uh, in a way it's the same one that sort of you know motivated Riemann in some sense uh, which is having to say that I've just you know give you just a little seed uh, you know I'm doing the usual thing I tell you I'm not going to tell you about it but then after all I just tell you about it uh, which is that in the same way, in some sense, you know, uh, you know, Newton's gravitation and is related to harmonic functions, and harmonic functions are, you know, Laplacian, and, uh, and complex analysis comes, you know, on, on the backpack. Um, you could say, you know, you could just say, well, you know, what are the natural fluctuations away from harmonic functions? Say, you know, what what would be that natural oscillation away from harmonic functions, or what would be the natural uh, way to fluctuations away from Euclidean distance in space, right? Sort of like, and in some sense, these type of structures that, when you try to understand them, then you, and very quickly in, into the the, the 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 topics I'm going to 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 tell you about. Now, um, let's try to to be concrete, and let me try to present to you sort of the 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 main couple of the main players, uh, objects in, in our, uh, in this uh, story. So we're looking for random compact connected subsets of the disk, right? So in some sense, we'd want to define measures, I mean, probability measures on things that are familiar to us. And uh, the idea would be, you know, we want to find random pictures if you can draw uh, as subsets of the unit disk. And we're going to give ourselves certain rules. And the first rule would be that the distribution, the law of this picture is invariant under any Möbius transformation of the disk. So you fix yourself, uh, you know, uh, any Möbius transformation. Here you have some random picture, right? And uh, you transform it by your fixed uh, Möbius transformation once you want that the distribution of the image that you have here is the same distribution as the one you started with. 
OK, so it's not very difficult to find you know, some random pictures that you can draw and that are conformally you know, invariant. Sort of the you know, simplest would be you, know, you, you fix a, just, you know, you fix some conformal triangle. I mean, you, you just define a, a random conformal triangle that contains the origin using some, you know, the, and then you just reflect this uh, infinitely many times, and then uh, you get a random picture. And if you just, you know, choose this picture to somehow to be translation invariant in the hyperbolic space, then you get one random picture that is conformally invariant. So it's it's very easy to, you know, find a random picture that is actually invariant under any. Mobius transformation, that's a piece of cake. So that's not all we want to do, but however, I want to note that when, we, when you have a random picture, sub-picture in the, in, the, in the unit disk that is actually invariant of any Mobius transformation, then you can actually define it also, you take any simply connected domain, and you can say, what's the, what's the law of the random picture that you would draw in this? simply connected domain, well, then you just say, well, I choose any conformal transformation from the unit disk into that domain. I have my picture here, right, that I, random picture that I did draw before. I transform it by my fixed conformal transformation here, and I have a, you know, random picture here. And, and this is the distribution, what we would call, of the random picture in this new domain that you have there, okay? so. OK, that's fine. We still have many possibilities to, to, to do this. And now comes the sort of the, the real important condition we want to put on our random picture. And this will have to do with, uh, you know, here comes Löwner somehow but uh, in, into the picture. But the idea is you want to look at your, think of your picture as a bit like a random sponge, right? So these are holes. Okay, and the, the object you have, the, the structure you're interested in is somehow the, the sponge here, right? And the idea will be, the condition you want to put is the following, is that if you take scissors, any, you know, you take your pair of scissors and you cut this open, say you cut it into two pieces like this, well, then this, you know, the sponge falls into, you know, is decomposed into several pieces. Actually, you could have more than two pieces uh, because, you know, you might have, you know, a hole, a hole that was doing this. And therefore, here you have a third piece, you know, so you have you know, the sponge is sort of divided into several pieces. And then the condition is like when you were a child and you were cutting, uh, well, I don't know if you were one of these nasty childs, but... Um, you are cutting uh, little worms that you were finding in the, in, the, in the ground, and you cut it, and then, well, the, the little piece you get is again a, a worm, right? <laughs> it actually continues to, to live you know, its own life, and it's sort of self-similar to the initial one you started with. And so the condition here is the following. I have my random picture. You take your orange scissors, you, you cut it into pieces, and now you have several pieces. And you look at them, so say you take this one, right? so it looks like you have this random sponge, it has this sort of picture like that. And so now what you do is you, you, know, you say, okay, let's use uh, Riemann's mapping theorem and map the outside right back to the unit disk. Right? So you restretch this in order for this to be back in the unit disk. And you get now a random picture. Right? You start with this random picture here. You cut it. You just take you know, one piece of one of the pieces. And you look at it, stretch it back. And now the condition that you want is that this random picture you get there is the same as the one you started with. It's not the same picture. right? It's the distribution of the picture. So the idea is to say, well, the, I have one experiment. Is I, I look at the picture I have at, to st I start with. This is one random experiment. And I have a ra another random experiment, which consists of not looking at the picture, cut it through, just take one piece of your sponge, expand it back, and now I have uh, uh, another picture. And the thing is, 
the distribution of these two random pictures are the same. Okay, this looks like quite a, you know, simple rules. Uh, right, so we want to understand, well, first, do such objects like that exist at all? Question number one. If so, if so yes, and what can we say about them? So if you think about it, it's a little bit like, you know, you want to find random structures defined in the unit disk that, you know, have conformal invariance built in, but also the, the way the conformal invariance is built in, sort of, you know, there's an interplay between the structure, here the location of the holes, and what you mean by conformal invariance then after, afterwards. Now, you, you know, you, so what the, the collection of, you know, of when a random collection or random set like that satisfies this property, we like to call it conformal loop ensemble, CLE. Uh, that's because one talks about the loops here, the holes, and not about the, the object, but I, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to say a random sponge, okay? So that you have a clear, you know, that you see that we focus on the actual set that we have here. So you can think about it a little bit. You first realize, well, of course, if you have, uh, if you want this picture to be invariant under, you know, Möbius transformation, it should have some sort of hyperbolic structure. There will be infinitely many holes, right? It will not be possible to have just one or two or three holes in there because the holes will, you will have plenty of holes near the, near the boundary. That's one first remark. And the other remark would be, if you think about what's the probability that a given point now is inside a hole, Because of conformal invariance, this probability does not depend on the actual point you're looking at. That's the first remark. And the second remark is, of course, that, you know, if, imagine now I take my scissors and I cut, I cut something out here, right? Maybe if you're lucky, by cutting this out, you're actually, you know, meeting a hole that surrounds this point. And then you discover that this point is inside a hole. If you're not lucky, right, so either you win and you're in a hole, and if you're not lucky, well, you didn't find something, but that means that this guy is, this point is somewhere sitting inside one of the pieces of the sponge you've cut away. And what's the probability now that this point is in a, in a, in a hole? Well, it's still the same as the one you started with. Okay, so what you see is either you win or you're allowed to play again the same game, right? Because then you can see, you know, in my remaining picture, is this point in a hole or not? Well, so if you, are, if you win or you're allowed to play again, then eventually you will win. So that means that this point, every, this point here, the probability that it sits inside a hole is one. Is that clear? So this simple argument tells you that every, each given point has a probability one of being in a hole. And this little argument just tells you, you know, well, that tells that if you interchange the, in, you know, you can integrate over all the points, the probability that it's in a hole, this will tell you that almost surely with probability one, the Lebesgue measure of the set of points that are in holes is one. In other words, if you have a, these random structures, they are fractal. So the, these compact sets that you have here Right? They will be typically, they, must, they will have to be of fractal nature, where basically the Lebesgue measure, random fractals, where the Lebesgue measure of the holes is one, but nevertheless, it doesn't, you know, doesn't contradict the fact that this guy here could be uh, connected. This random sponge would be connected. So the idea you have in mind now, you know, is that if you have something like that, it should be some random randomized version of structures that are reminiscent either of the Sierpinski carpet, right? Which is one of those guys where, you know, the Lebesgue measure of, this, of the holes is actually uh, full. Or, well, you know, a gasket, right? Sort of uh, where you remove the holes and the holes would actually sort of touch the boundary and you would have something like that. So, it looks like the shape of the holes will be random, 
but the idea will be that these conformal loop ensemble or these random sponges, they would have to be, uh, you know, random fractals of a certain type if they exist at all. Of course, the first reaction is to say, well, this is just way too strong a condition. These objects like that cannot exist. On the other hand, if you think of, uh, you know, random systems coming from physics, and you try to view these, you view these holes as boundaries of interfaces for a nearest neighbor interaction model, uh, then immediately you see, well, these, you know, systems coming from physics, they should satisfy this type of property provided that they are conformally invariant. Okay, so now, any question about the definition and first properties of these objects? So, now, as a, you know, first theorem I want to mention, uh, which uh, is due to, I mean, there are sort of several layers, but uh, one of the main players in this story is Sheffield. Then we have this long paper together uh, on, on this topic, and there are also um, important contribution by Miller, Sheffield, and my, uh, Miller and Sheffield, and where you can sum up this by saying, well, there are only there's you know the collection of possible random sponges like this is a one-dimensional. You have one parameter you can play it, or one real parameter that we like to call kappa. And for each value of kappa, you have one random distribution, one random picture that you can define like that. And you have no other ways. Right? So uh, we know all possible uh, random sponges. And uh, it's a one parameter family And for historical reasons, it's indexed by a number kappa that belongs to a third and eight. Somehow the limit when going to a third and eight is somehow a third would be the random sponge, which is actually full. I mean, you could take the random pictures that there's nothing to see, so you cut it open. There's still nothing to see. You put it back. You have the entire disk. That would be one limiting case, and the other case, other in the other direction, would be somehow that uh, you know, it's empty. Right? So there's nothing to see anymore. But okay, it's indexed by by kappa, and you have two type of, and you will have you know then comes you know some numerology, you know, funny things that tells you that I mean there are two type of sponges. So you have the, those that are gaskets, right, where somehow the, the holes don't touch, never touch each other and never touch the outer boundary. And uh, this would correspond to the value kappa between 8 third and 4. And for the gaskets, so the idea would be that you have a picture like that and then you have all these holes. And it has, of course, this, you know, Escher hyperbolic type feeling that, you know, you have, you know, here you have plenty of small holes and so on. And uh, what you know, and that's the sort of the numerology type thing, that if I choose the random gasket correspond to this value of kappa, then we know what the fractal dimension of the boundary of the holes is. It's going to be 1 plus kappa over 8. And we know that what the dimension of the of the sponge actually is? Yes. Uh, I'll come back to that, but of course, you, okay. So somehow the value of kappa, I haven't tell, told you, you know, what kappa means. So at this point, I don't prefer don't to ask. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's a carpet. Sorry. The important feature is that, uh, um, yeah, I always get it wrong. <laughs> it's not much better in French because in French it would be tami and tapis, and, and again you are <laughs> you always get it wrong as well. So, 
even worse. Anyway, so this is the carpet. Sorry, right? This is the one where the, the holes don't touch each other. And the dimension of this guy, if I remember it correctly, is 1 plus 2 over kappa plus, I mean, there's, you know, uh, something like that. Not quite sure about the formula, the dimension. Okay, that's some new magic numerology that you can, you know, find. Um, I mean, the fun part is somehow that this tells you that, for instance, the dimension of the boundaries of these holes, if you look at, you know, the, the carpets, it will vary, it will be allowed to vary between four-thirds and three-halves. But it can't be smaller than four-thirds, it can't be larger than three-halves. If you, unless you, you are not going to have a cup. You know, you have these sort of strange features. And you see that, I mean, if you, if you look at the definition, it looks like, you know, abstract nonsense definition, very simple conditions, and then you end up with some, you know, strange features. And, and again, you know, the dimension of the carpet, if I didn't get it wrong, indeed, when you get eight thirds, I think you should get uh, two. And when you go down to kappa equal four, you get something like 15 over eight, right? So this, the smallest possible gasket has a certain fractal dimension, 15 over eight. And then you have the gaskets. They would correspond to kappa larger than four. And they have the same formula, right? So the picture there would be more like the holes, each hole is touching the boundary at a fractal set of points, and then you have a picture a bit like that, so reminiscent of the Sierpinski uh, gasket, except that you don't touch the boundary at three points, but you sort of touch the boundary on a fractal set of points. Okay, and of course, if you know Kappa, if you've heard, you know, Oded or anybody talking about SLE, uh, you remember that we like to parameterize SLEs by a parameter kappa, and it's the same kappa. So in some sense, these boundaries here will be, will be one of those SLE-type curves or basically loops. So just for, you know, little motivation, uh, kappa equals four is special, um, obviously. It's uh, special in the sense that it comes up very naturally in this initial question I gave you when I said, you know, what's the natural oscillation away from the Riemann, from the Euclidean distance in two dimensions? You try to see what, is there a way, you know, to make the wiggle the distance between points in a natural way, in a random way? And what comes out of the picture is sort of this fairly, you know, of course I'm sort of a bit, uh, I just want to stimulate your imagination more than, you know, saying concrete results here. But what comes out, roughly speaking, is that the natural structure that emerges will be that the, 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 the space uh, will sort of, you will have sort of fracture lines. So the sort of, the, the idea will be that the metric, if whatever that means, you know, will have, there will be sort of lines along which on one side everything looks a bit li larger than on the other side. Right? And these things, you know, somehow it's, it's not like the perturbation of the metric will be something super smooth. It will be something, you know, uh, with sort of jumps and sort of fracture lines and, and these type of whole structure that we have here are exactly the way that, you know, uh, these things will, uh, I mean, how this happens. Now, for kappa equal four. Now I want to, um, so that's one story. And I hope I presented it to you in a way that you could see that, well, the, you know, the, 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 the question is natural somehow, and somehow the answers are non-trivial. Uh, and of course, I didn't tell you anything about how to prove this. This is a, this is a long story, right? You have a couple of hundred pages to, to swallow uh, before uh, uh, seeing how, how, how the proof goes. But, now, I want to say, tell you another story. Uh, and the other story uh, is, um, is the following. So here what we have are random fractal structures, and they are naturally related to conformal invariance. Okay. And um, 
So my, my first, I, I want to tell you two stories before actually trying to go to the, the main uh, result I want to, to, to explain. And of course, given time, I will not have time to give you many more details either. The first idea is sort of the, the idea, you know, I'm going back to Odette Schramm's SLEs. And um, let me try to present it in an abstract way that is reminiscent of what I did here. I have a simply connected domain. And I'm, I want to do an experiment that is conformally invariant. Right, so that somehow, and my experiment is to use scissors. I want to cut this domain open in a random way. Right, I want to you know, take my scissors and cut it open. And I want two things. The first thing would be that the way I do it is conformally invariant. So in the sense that uh, I, I start cutting this open, should be more or less invariant on the group of Möbius transformations. Of course, you need to know where you start, right, and more or less where you go, but I'll come back to that in a moment. And the other thing what you want to do is the following, is that if I start cutting open, I reach this. Now, well, you just use Riemann's uh, mapping theorem sort of to uniformize the slit domain into the original domain, right? So the red part now is somewhere, has been, you know, mapped down. So you cut it open, you map back, and what you remain, what you have to do now is to cut open starting from the image of this point. So here what we do is say, imagine we take for when you have a slit domain here, gamma t, you define ft, gamma t starts from zero. You define ft to be the conformal transformation from uh, the domain minus gamma up to time t into c. And you're going to map f of gamma t back to zero. And you're going to say ft at infinity will be like uh, z. Right? So this characterizes your conformal transformation ft. And what you want, right? The condition is something, a bit something like similar there. If I cut up to a certain time t, you stop, you go out, you have coffee break. Uh, and now we say, OK, coming back, I need to continue cutting. How am I going to cut, continue cutting? Well, the way I'm going to continue to cut is exactly as if I first map this back, and I do the same experiment again, starting from here. Right? So the law of the picture of what remains to be done is always the same. You're always sitting on the boundary of a simply connected domain, and you cut into it, and you always do the same modulo conformal transformation. OK. okay. So there's a you know, very simple remark, which is that if you parameterize time here in some sense by the size seen from infinity of what you're cutting away, you can, there exists this, you know, the, this expansion here at infinity. You can write it like z plus something that you could call wt, which would be sort of the real constant shift term that you get here, plus something that you can choose to be, to increase linearly plus little o, 1 over z. Right, so this is just a way to decide how to parameterize this growing slit. This condition, that what remains to be done is just a copy of what I started with, means that you know, if you compose two independent guys like that, you should get exactly uh, the guy up to time 2t. You know, I cut open, I'm at back, I cut open, I'm at back. It's the same as if I had cut open all the way without break. And so this tells you immediately that this t gives wt has to be basically a Brownian motion. No chance. You know, that's just the, the way it is, because it's sort of additive. You know, adding wt plus an independent copy of wt, you will have to have basically the guy up to time 2t. So this tells you this guy has to be a Brownian motion. And then you read you know, Alphos, and uh, you, know, you learn about uh, Loewner's uh, equation. And you say, well, but uh, actually, the knowledge of this function t gives wt characterizes the whole sequence ft, and it characterizes gamma. 
So basically, this is Schramm's idea that says, well, you know, if I want to have a random curve that cuts it open, I have only one parameter family of guys. It is basically I have to choose WT to be a Brownian motion running at a certain speed, which I call kappa. So WT is this real guy, you know, that measures, you know, if this guy goes more to the left or to the right, seen from infinity, roughly speaking. And this one has to be uh, brown. Okay. Now, there's an additional condition that I want to emphasize, which is that if you are looking for a random procedure, right, where infinity doesn't actually play a special role, that when I start cutting, it should be invariant under the Möbius transformation that, in, you know, uh, sends infinity to one, I mean, keeps zero fixed, infinity to one, and minus one to infinity, right? So you start pushing it like that. And you want that the way you start cutting is actually the same random way, starting from zero. Then you see that there's just one kappa, such that somehow this cutting procedure is independent of infinity, somehow, where the choice where the other boundary thing, is kappa equals six. So there's a special way of cutting open the domain. Right? That's the idea. I have here just one point here. I give you just information of where you start cutting. And you know, you could target this point, that point, this other point. It doesn't matter. There's just one random way to start cutting open this thing uh, in, in this, uh, that satisfies this property here. And the fact that the law of this orange curve is the same if infinity is here or if infinity is there. So it's sort of really growing locally. OK. And this is the sort of Schramm's uh, idea that said, yeah, well, kappa equals 6 has to be the scaling limit of critical percolation interfaces because these are the models in, in, in statistical physics that have this locality, this sort of local property. OK, so we have this special random curve. And that's the, I mean, this is a curve with dimension, uh, uh, OK, 7 fourths. And uh, OK, it's an interesting curve. Now, we have other, so that's one story. Now, the other story is saying now this idea, we sh the idea is to say that this red curve is a random pro way to explore random way to explore this domain, the simply connected domain you have in front of you, right? So you have this disk, and you have this random, you know, this, you want to cut open, you want to sort of discover it, and you discover it completely at random by cutting, you know, cutting open at random uniformly in some sense is giving you this random curve here that you could characterize, you know, very simply using Loewner's formalism. So now the question is, uh, what can one do uh, when you try to explore uh, you know, this fractal domain here? We want to do something similar, which is we want to discover fractal domains. So let me now take a second uh, background uh, story uh, that sort of is complementary of, of this exploration story there. Imagine I have any fractal domain. So you could say, let's take the Sierpinski ca uh, carpet. Now, when you're doing complex analysis, uh, you read, I don't know, Kerber's uh, uniformization theorem, say, OK, you know, we, it's nice to do complex analysis when you have holes. It's actually fun. Um, and what happens when the, you know, the number of holes goes to infinity and when you have a guy like that, which is actually uh, not an open set anymore, but uh, it's actually a fractal with zero Lebesgue measure. What remains, you know, what is there still complex analysis living inside this fractal? And the answer is yes. Okay, and there are different ways to approach this. If you are coming, you know, from Alfors, uh, Kerber, uh, you know, uh, vision, you want to say, well, is there a uniformization theorem that says, is there a natural uni, uni, you know, way to uniformize the Sierpinski carpet? And the answer is yes, and you probably heard Mario Bonk uh, explain you that 
in some sense, there's a unique uh, transformation that you know maps this uh, Sierpinski carpet, uh, carpet into a, a circle, circular fractal carpet, right? something like that. That's one way to try to approach it, but that tells you already, you know, when I have fractals, actually there is conformal structure sitting inside the fractals, even though I can always distort the holes as I want. You know, the holes are really holes. They are sitting out there outside my domain. There's a second thing you can do, is to say, well, um, Laplacian, right? You want to define some sort of Laplacian sitting in there, or alternatively, is there a Brownian motion in the carpet? Is there something like, the Brownian motion that would live inside this carpet. And again, uh, you have uh, uh, the sequence of papers in the 90s by Chris Birdsey and Rich, Rick, I mean Bass, who proved that indeed you can make sense of what Brownian motion would be in this fractal. Of course, it's tricky, right? Because the, if you want to move around in this fractal, you have these obstacles you know, in front of you everywhere. They're blocking you. So the Brownian motion here would have a very non-diffusive behavior. Right? So it will have to, to you know, because at each scale, you are blocked by things at large. So you have to sort of do some, uh, something with the, the clock of the Brownian motion. And, and for those of you who know Mario's paper, so there are striking similarities between you know, the two approaches. The approach is basically saying, well, you know, let's, let's first look at what happens when you have only finitely many holes. You can do, apply Kerber's uh, uniformization theorem. And then you will say, well, because we add the holes everywhere more or less in a self-similar way, things will stabilize. And the Brownian motion has a similar picture that you, know, you, you understand the Brownian motion when you have finitely many holes. And then when you add more and more holes because of the exact self-similarity structure, the, the, you know, the Brownian motion somehow in the finitely connected domain will converge to the Brownian motion. So, you know, well speeded up will converge to the Brownian motion in the, in the, in the fractal. Okay, that's one way to, to probe some of conformal invariance. Um, but, of course, you might say, um, I mean, you, one might wonder how, you know, relevant the Brownian motion that moves in this and this object actually is, that's one, one thing. And one might wonder, you know, how, uh, you know, how um, robust these general features are. And um, now I want to explain a third way to, you know, to use conformal invariance, which is this one here. Right, which is, you know, how to cut open in a conformally invariant way somehow the, this structure that you have here. So, and maybe I'll just, you know, say two words. The, the first thing is that this structure I defined to you, and I'm just going to say, spend five minutes saying little statistical physics story, but in a very elementary way. Um, well, not statistical physics, you know, a simple model picture. One way to understand what this unique green curve here is, is to say that, roughly speaking, you are coloring at random the plane in, with two colors. So maybe the good idea would be to say you take a hexagonal lattice, honeycomb lattice, and each cell will be toss a coin to decide whether it's orange or green. And then what you're doing is, you know, you're coloring the boundary, one half of the boundary in green, one half of the boundary in orange. And this slicing open that you have there will be exactly the random curve that you see by, you know, exploring the interface between the green cluster attached to the green boundary and the orange cluster attached to the orange boundary. And conformal invariance, right, you know, when you start cutting open with your scissors that have green on the right and orange on the left, we are just exploring this boundary. Well, now you have cut it open. 
you haven't discovered the states of the coloring that remain to be discovered there. And you have a domain where on the boundary here everything is green, and on this one boundary everything is orange. And therefore, it's sort of the if the limit of this curve here when the mesh of the lattice goes to zero is conforming invariant. And the limit, it should be the one I described there because it will have this you know, uh, combination of conforming invariants, slicing open, and, uh, and, um, and uh, loca locality property. So what happens when you color the Sierpinski carpet at random. So here the idea would be to say, let's take all the clusters to be green. The, whole, the clusters are green. Right? And now you color at random, orange or green, the remaining part. Well, I mean, clearly green will win because you, compared to the previous picture, you have all these holes that are everywhere, so green will, will win. But if on microscopic level, you give an advantage to orange. You say, well, on the small scale, the hexagons, the orange guy will have probability three quarters to be there, and the greens one will have to have probability one quarter to be there. And you think about it, and then what you realize is that if you tune the microscopic model conveniently, then you will be able to have macroscopic orange clusters that are infiltrating inside the fractal. So you will have you know, orange paths you know, that are sort of fiddling their way within the fractal. And there will be a phase transition and there will be you know, a parameter where you can make sense of what, what is now the sort of exploration of this fractal. You know, what's the outer boundary of the orange cluster touching the orange boundary inside this fractal? Okay, so, so the idea was each time you bump into a, a hole, right, then the hole is green so it's on your right, so you have, to, you, know, you have to go around it like this. However, sort of the pressure, the orange pressure is sort of infinite, but well tuned so that actually you, you are able to make it through inside this uh, little uh, piece. Okay? So the question is, you know, can we describe the, this continuum structure, this continuum curve, right, that should be, play the role of these SLE6 in this fact? What we have in our hands is conformal invariance. We would expect that, again, something like that would respect conformal invariance, but we are in a very bad shape because something goes completely wrong when we try to adapt this, which is when you start cutting this open, you want to cut it back, uniformize this by Riemann's mapping theorem. Everything was fine there because we had a you know, simply connected domain. You map it back, you're back in the simply connected domain. But here, of course, when you cut open, you map back, you know, all the relative positions and sizes of the holes have moved. So you have to keep track somehow of infinitely many parameters, you know, to keep track of the actual conformal structure of the remaining to be discovered domain, right? Because when you slice open, all, you know, all these, all these holes will move and, and jump around. So this seems that there's an obstruction here that tells you, well, that we're not going to be make this, able to make this work here in this picture. However, if you think about it, my, the message is, and this is that actually it is possible to make it work if the fractal you're looking at is not a Sierpinski carpet or a, a deterministic one, but if the fractal itself is the one that nature really produced. So what I, what I want to emphasize, you know, that's a very provocative statement, but it's sort of saying that the random sponges I described to you at the beginning, they are the fractals that actually you find you know, around you. They are the ones that, you know, when I was a child and you know, I, was, I had the, the, the rusty Renault uh, car that we have, we all had, everybody had in France, and, it was rusty, it had the rusty hole, and you know, you learn, you know, don't touch the rusty hole, you're going to cut your finger because it's, okay, that's, and because it's, uh, and then you say, because you're a smart little child here, yeah, because it's fractal, so it's like, a, you know, the boundary is fractal, so therefore it's like a knife, and I'm going to cut my, my finger, so. Um, 
Anyway, that was a bad joke. It didn't work. Uh, uh, the, 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 the shape of the hole is actually one of these random things, right? One of these random holes that I've sort of described. Of course, it's not true, but anyway, you know, just this idea that we don't really see, you know, the Sipinski carpet, you know, in real life, you know. Pretty tough to actually find it, you know, produced by some on its own by in nature around you. Uh, whereas these other guys, you know, it's it's not just what I'm saying is it's, it's not just saying well, oh, let's do something, you know, fun. Let's try to do this, play this game in these special fractals we define, which are themselves random, and see what happens. Well, but it's sort of there's sort of some motivation to do that because these fractals are not you know, they are actually the ones that you see around. In in physical system, phase transitions, or whatever. Now, now the thing is the following. You do this usual trick that we like to use. In the, the probabilists like to use quenched and annealed when they try to describe this, but I don't want to use this. The idea is to say, well, I cut this open. Right? In front of me, I have this random fractal with these fractal random holes sitting there. I don't know yet where they are. I cut open. The, all the holes are green, right? So I cut this open. And when I meet a hole, right, it's green. I discover it, you know, when I bump into a hole, well, I discover the entire hole. And then I need to continue exploring. When I do this, the rule I gave you about, you know, cutting open, slicing open my domain, the rule was I have my fractal carpet here. And I cut open in a deterministic way. What remains to be discovered, you know, uh, is the, the, the holes that I have not discovered yet are distributed like uh, the holes that in, in the remaining to be discovered domain, provided that each time I bump into a hole, I cut out the entire, you know, it's like a psh, uh, puncture, then the, you discover the entire hole at once, once you bump into it with your scissors. Now, you could do that by, you know, I have, I'm sitting here on the boundary, and I cut very carefully a little slit, infinitesimal slit. I told you we are going to discover immediately little holes because every given point will be inside holes. So even if you be very careful, you will immediately discover you know, holes. But still, what you will discover will be small. And then you can decide, well, you know, now I continue cutting depending on what I have. You know, I can iterate this procedure because what remains to be discovered has the same distribution as what I started with. And you can sort of adapt where you're continuing to cut depending on the holes that you have discovered so far. Right? So by iterating the initial thing by, you know, cut very carefully a little bit, discover what I have, and now I'm going to cut here to the right or to the left depending on what I've already defined. You are going to be able to mimic this thing that you know you cut open a little bit. I discover a hole. Then you know I have to continue going around in this direction. I'm going to cut here, and if you do this very carefully, right, this thing, you will have the property that I start cutting open. I want to define a random curve gamma right, that has the following property that. Conditionally on the curve gamma, and I attach all the holes. That is, has the property that each time I bump into a hole, I have to go turn left, right? Because the hole is green. I'm looking at my interface: orange on the right, green on the on the right, uh, orange on the left, green on the left. Anyway, um, right? So each time I bump, the rule is: each time I bump into the hole, gr the hole is on my right, and when I stop. I make a coffee break, I come back, what remains to be discovered, right? I'm sitting here, my boundary is orange here, green on the other side. The law of what remains to be done is what uh, is the conformal image of the law what I started with. And here you're using the fact that the not yet discovered holes are distributed exactly, you know, as long as you haven't discovered them, they are not there. And so therefore the law of the remaining to be discovered fractal domain is always distributed like the one you started with. So in some sense, you re-average after each time you re-average about you know, the conformal structure of the remaining to be discovered domain. You don't need to keep track of your, in your bag you know, about the relative positions of all the holes that you have in front of you. Right? 
Because you could say, well, I don't know where they are, so they will be distributed like the initial distribution because I have one of these very special fractal domains where uh, the, the distribution of the holes that remain to be discovered is actually uh, uh, always uh, the same in the remaining to be discovered domain, modular conforming that. So what you get here is that, so you see here, I'm just saying the following, what we are after here is something where we want a procedure to cut open in an adaptive way our domain, that's what we're after, in such a way that it's local. You know, I cut open, each time I bump into a hole, I turn to, my le to the left, and it's local as long as I don't bump into the you know, holes that I have in front of you, I don't, this will not influence me, and of course, always you know, re-average about the distribution of the remaining to be discovered holes. So the theorem is, uh, and of course, you know, I've not been very precise. So this is this paper we're writing now with Jason Sheffield and Sheffield. This is one way to present the result. There are sort of other ways to approach it, which is to say, well, we know what this random curve is, right? So we know. what the law of the, of course, unique local um, and conformally invariant way to cut open a random sponge is. So what happens is that I have my sponge here, um, my random sponge, which is here. It has the, this fractal dimension you know, given by this value of kappa. And what happens is that the curve that you're going to describe here, that is the unique random curve that somehow is the analog of SLE6 here, the unique percolation, you know, what would be the natural random curve that you could view as continuous percolation inside a uh, boundary inside my fractal that you can really just view as, you know, the unique way, natural way to cut open my domain in a Leuvener way, in a random, you know, Leuvener equation type way in my, uh, you know, uh, fractal domain. And it turns out that actually this curve, there's a duality type property that shows up that this curve that you define here is exactly d going around the fractal uh, gasket. I mean, so each gasket is associated a carpet. And what happens somehow is that by moving around here, the sort of, uh, you, you get the, the, I mean, there's a the sort of duality that tells you that to each random carpet is associated a random gasket. And that somehow these, this percolation interface is actually sort of a, uh, yeah, okay, maybe, anyway, we know what it is and it has dimension, sort of the interface, for instance, has dimension uh, is, I mean, this random curve is an SLE of dimension 16 over kappa, which should not surprise you. For those of you who know the duality between FK models and POTS models or anyway. Uh, but there's a natural st structure that says that somehow this, this curve here, what happens is that this curve you go inside, right? And each time I see a hole, I somehow go around the hole and I continue like that. So it's a little bit like what you're discovering is somehow a little bit like, you know, a structure with, you know, a tree with the leaves that are only on the one side. And the trunk of this tree somehow is this percolation interface. Except that the trunk is actually a curve that bounces on itself as well. It's a quite a convoluted curve, but we can sort of describe it. And uh, so again, you know, you can, you know, sell, we could, one can try to sell this result to, you know, 
people who are not coming from stochastic, I mean, from statistical physics or not interested in the theoretical physics in the play by saying, well, you know, there's a unique random curve sitting in each of these fractals, random fractals that have the property that it actually, you know, when you slide it open, you map it back, you get uh, this new uh, structure there. Now, this works only for kappa smaller than four. For kappa equal four, um, there's, no, there's no way to infiltrate. What happens is that the, the, um, the fractal somehow is, uh, even though its dimension doesn't, nothing special happens to its dimension, goes to 16. Or what happens is that at kappa equal four, the, the, this carpet is of a very different type. Roughly speaking, when kappa is equal to four, when kappa is strictly smaller than four, the carpet is a bit like the Sierpinski carpet, right? So the holes are, you know, away from each other, fairly separated, and at each scale they're separated at a similar scale. When kappa is equal to four, the holes are larger, and then occasionally you will find holes that are very close to each other, big holes that are close to each other, and then the, the you know, it's they, this problem, this will be the main problem that the percolation that this, you know, orange guy will have to circumvent, will have to, you know, I have to go through these tiny holes and something goes wrong. So the only way to do it is to, you know, you put more pressure, you put more pressure, more, more orange, more orange. And it's, so you don't make it, you're blocked by these holes. And as soon as you're able to make it through these, you know, these little things, then you actually invade everything, right? So this is the nature of the phase percolation, phase transition within the CLE4 carpet is actually a very different nature than in the other cases. Yeah. Now there's one additional thing. So what the, the final comment I want to make is here, one understands in these random sponges, one understands what, you know, Löwner Schramm is doing, right? So how to cut open, how to map back, um, and how to, um, you know, cut open randomly in a conformally invariant way. So again, that means that these random curves, they use in a very intrinsic way something that has to do with the conformal structure sitting in the hole in this carpet itself. It, it uses, it's a random object. It uses no information about, you know, the holes. It's invariant under any conformal transformation of your domain into itself. Uh, you know, that preserves the holes. So if you are, you know, you can distort this, decide that this hole now is a, is, is a line or whatever. The, the random thing you define there is actually still sort of will have this conformal invariance property. So using really something having to do with the essential conformal structure sitting in the holes. Um, and this is one thing, you know, this is one uh, interesting feature. Now, I want to I mean, mention one uh, thing that two people in the audience here, Stefan and Brent, uh, Stefan Rode and Brent Werners, they are, I understand, uh, about to finalize the write-up of the fact that for those carpets here, you can uh, adapt, in a certain way, Mario Bonk's ideas, because I told you these fractals, when kappa is strictly smaller than four, they are randomized versions of the Sipinski carpet, but uh, still things are under control, and they are so much under control that you can actually adapt, Mar that they are able to adapt Mario's paper to say that there's a unique, there's a uniformization theorem for these carpets, right? So that somehow there's, these random carpets have a unique, you know, uh, circle domain, I mean, up to Möbius transformation, a unique, you know, circle domain version, equivalent version. So, which is also a way to describe the, the, the you know, the intrinsic fractal structure. Is that correct? The, the statement is correct? Okay, okay. Okay, but they're able to uniformize it. Okay. But that's an, you know, we're not able to define, at this point, nobody is able to define the Brownian motion in these objects. And the question is whether it's worth the effort because, you know. Well, you have to control things. I mean, of course, you might say, you know, of course, you know what you want to do. You might say, well, I just, keep the largest holes, I take the Brownian motions as is bouncing on the, on the boundaries, and then, you know, I put more and more holes, I have to, to fiddle with my clock so that, indeed, uh, you know, things don't blow up, and then when the number of holes, you know, there are more and more holes, things should be under control, and this guy should converge to something, but, 
we don't know how to do this. And for those of you who know the Bas Barlow papers, uh, already in the Sipinski carpet, it's a, it's a total nightmare to actually you know, control it, even in the case where the things are deterministic. So it's hard to, it's, it's really tricky. Also, I want to emphasize two things. One thing is that here, when you say there's the conformal structure here, each, in each of these questions, you are actually probing different things in the sense that maybe some of you have heard about you know, Liouville Brownian motion in a, in a Gaussian free field, things all like that. Here, somehow, when you do this percolation inside the fractal, what happens is that all the information somehow in the, all the randomness sitting in the fractal will be located at special points in the fractals that are going to be very important in order to decide if the interface is going right or left. I already mentioned that in the case of these very small tubules here, that somehow these are, you know, when the, there will be some points sitting in the fractal that are where it's more important to know if this point is green or orange than others. And so the idea is that there will be those sort of, so fractal, you know, like a bit like in a multifractal spectrum type ideas, there will be some, the information will be sitting in a special fractal subset of this domain for percolation. Whereas, say, for uniformization or for Brownian motion, the information might sit actually elsewhere or a bit elsewhere. So, you know, you are probing in these fractal things, somehow, you know, things are not smooth and though which were is actually the information about the conformal invariant structure that you're looking at is actually sitting, might depend on the question you ask to your fractal. So typically, there's no relation about the fractal dimension of the carpet itself, right? <laughs> there's no, oh yes, I'm over time, sorry. Uh, uh, there's no, somehow, you know, the, the dimension of the fractal itself has nothing to do with, you know, what happens in terms of percolation because the percolation structure will be actually sitting in actually a fractal subset of the carpet itself. So there's sort of this sort of averaging type thing going on. Okay, I'm over time. I'm getting thrown bottles at my, yeah, so I have to certainly stop. And also I want to say that uh, as the last speaker, of course, it's my great pleasure to, on behalf of all speakers, uh, to thank again our organizers for setting up everything so smoothly and uh, it's, you know, for those of you or us who organized conferences like that, you very well know that the more smoothly it is for you, that means that the more, you know, last minute uh, uh, and uh, tricky things have to been handled by someone. So I understand that Karen has been the main uh, uh, person in charge of it and with a big smile saying that she's there so to make sure everything is fine for us. But uh, and uh, indeed, so I just want to thank again the, everybody and all of you for sticking to the end of the last talk before catching your train. And thank you.